Hi, my name is Joe. I am the venomous snake keeper for the largest reptile sanctuary in the U.S., the Phoenix Herpetological Sanctuary, and you're watching Vexit. That one was a weird one. Uh, that uh, white speckled rattlesnake you were just zoomed in on is named Cassandra, and she came to us last summer and was found somewhere near Tempe. Um, somebody's pet cat was just pawing at it in the backyard, and thankfully the cat was okay. But the weird thing is, uh, white specks like that, you don't really find anywhere near this part of the state. Um, they're in Arizona, but they're more typically found in the southern part of the state. And so we think that was someone's pet that escaped. Um, but anyway, in here, I've got two Western Diamondbacks. They are the most common venomous snake in Arizona. Um, they're the most common rattlesnake, but not the only rattlesnake. We have 13 different species in Arizona. And I'm gonna crack this open so I can feed her. And I have them just sit in a bag in warm water. And the warm water is important with rattlesnakes because they are pit vipers, so they use that heat as a way to let them see and hunt. And if things aren't warm, usually they're not interested in striking at it. I'm just gonna try to slowly get her attention. I always tell people, oh, there he is. <laughs> Venomous snake feeding is a little bit like fishing where you have to get their attention, but if you make too much noise or shake it around too much right in their face, they get scared of it. There are two in there, so I'm just gonna bring the second one in. This one in the back is an albino. And sadly enough, that's another one that killed its previous owner. And again, it's not the snake's fault by any means. The, the person thought he had a hand-tamed rattlesnake and was at a house party. He'd been drinking, which is really common with bites that actually lead to death. And he was walking around the house party showing off his hand-tamed rattlesnake. And he wanted to show off just how calm and docile his albino beauty was that he ended up trying to kiss it on the head. And when he put his face next to it, it bit him on the throat and normally you're not gonna die from a rattlesnake bite, but because of the location, he was dead before he was able to make it to the hospital. And he already bit one, so he might not bite it again. Uh, rattlesnakes in the wild will normally bite and then release their prey because they don't want to put up with having to fight it. Oh, that one's going again, his now. Um, they rather let the venom do the work so they'll bite it and then wait four or five minutes and then track it down and figure out where it ran off to before it died. So they lock, unlock their jaw? Kind of. The, the idea of them unhinging their jaws is not exactly correct. It, it stays hinged in the, in the back there the whole time. Uh, the bigger adaptation they have is the front of their jaw, and the top jaw and bottom jaw isn't connected right here. And so I'll set this down so I can mime it. If, if I had a snake jaw, it wouldn't so much be this part of my jaw coming unhinged to open wider down. It's the center of my jaw that would open out um, this way. And that's what gives snakes their ability to eat things four or five times their own head. Do you ever have where the snakes will end up trying to eat the same? Uh... The same rodent? Yeah. Yeah, it happens fairly commonly with some of our snakes. And so for those snakes, I just don't feed them together. I'll separate them. These two are usually pretty good about finding their own food and leaving each other alone. Um, but if I do feed snakes and they're in the same enclosure like this, I, I don't leave them unsupervised. I'll stay here until they're done eating.
people think of rattlesnakes as these vicious predators, but they, they really are kind of cautious and somewhat prissy eaters. They, they don't like to have a lot going on around them. And the big reason for that is just they're so vulnerable when they're eating. That's their, their one way to defend themselves is their mouth. And so if they see anything different going on, or if there's a lot of noise that day, it can sometimes make them a little slower to take. Uh, my red tail boa constrictor at home, I've never been able to film from start to finish her eating because she just gets too nervous if I have a camera in the room and somehow she always knows. <laughs> Now that they're both started on their own, I should be able to go on to the next one. Uh, these come from opposite side of the country. These are our eastern diamondbacks, and they're native to Florida. And they are the biggest species of rattlesnake in the U.S. They can get up to around eight feet long when they're fully grown. And what are the other snakes uh, typically? Sorry? How big do the other snakes get, the, the diamondbacks you just were? Um, these western diamondbacks, out in the wild, they'll, a real big one will be around four feet. Uh, but in captivity, where they're getting fed often, they tend to get a little bit bigger and they can get up to six feet long if you've had them in captivity their whole life and have been feeding them very consistently. All right, so this one is a bit of a psycho. When I open this, he'll probably strike out a foot or two. Turn that on for a little better lighting. Right. He might make me a liar today. Let's see. <laughs> there are two in this enclosure, so the other one's in this back corner. You should be able to get close without really worrying. And uh, I won't put you through filming and watching, I can always do it later. Uh, but typically as I go through here, um, because we have so many hundreds of snakes, uh, I don't just rely on my memory to keep track of feeding them. So I keep track of every day I'm in an enclosure, uh, what I did for it, if I just changed the water, if I fed it, uh, things like that. That way we have detailed records on the care of all of our animals. are our Central American rattlesnakes. And they are some of my favorites in our collection, but they're also uh, one of the most venomous species, if not the most venomous species of rattlesnake in the world. There's about 34 species out there. And part of what makes them so venomous is unlike the rattlesnakes we have here in the US that are mainly gonna have a hemotoxic venom that attacks blood cells. Yeah, the Central American rattlesnakes have a much bigger neurotoxic element to their venom. So instead of just attacking blood cells and causing local tissue damage, they can cause more systemic bodily failures, kind of like the, the black mambas can. And uh, he won't strike out of the cage, but if you wanted to be right over there, you'll have a, a good safe angle of them. And the second one in there, I don't know if you can see his eyes at all, uh, but his eyes look blue right now. And that is a dead giveaway that he's getting ready to shed his skin. Uh, usually their eyes will turn blue for a couple days and they'll slowly get clear again. And then right when they get completely clear, usually that means they're gonna shed in the next day or two.
just because I, I knew that I always loved reptiles as a kid, but I didn't really have anybody in my life who also loved reptiles or knew about opportunities like this. So my, my parents were supportive and all, but I didn't really know where to look and neither did they. So I had to figure things out for myself. And that's kind of something I, why I post so many videos on YouTube and now TikTok and everywhere else is I, I want to be able to introduce people to these animals and show them, hey, this is, this is something the world needs. Uh, we are really the only reptile sanctuary of this scale across the entire U.S. So we take animals in from everywhere from Ohio and Michigan to Oregon and California and really and Florida. We really cover every corner of the country and it would really help lighten our load if there were a few other sanctuaries like this out there. Uh, so this is one of my favorite species I have the privilege of working with. Uh, this is a Mengshan viper. They are from China and they're a really reclusive species of viper that a lot wasn't known about for a long time. And when I first started caring for them, all the stuff I had researched on them and stuff I had found even in textbooks said that this was the only species of viper in the world that could spit its venom. Uh, since I've been doing this for so long, and you can get close, he'll keep that in his mouth. Uh, since I've been doing this so long, I've come to find out that that is just a widely believed urban legend about them. They can't spit their venom. They, they don't have the fangs that it would take. Um, but it got published in textbooks and every forum on the web about this species. And so for probably the first year I worked with them and until I got a chance to talk to other zookeepers and other researchers, I was wearing glasses just like I did with the spitting cobra um, because we just didn't know at the time if they could spit or not. And now um, I've got a reasonable confidence that that's not something that they can do. They're, they're not different from other vipers. Um, but I did find out that they end up musking uh, musking is something that snakes can do when they feel intimidated but don't necessarily want to bite. It's kind of like a skunk spraying to make themselves smell bad. Uh, a lot of snakes have scent glands that they can musk with. And this species, it doesn't just ooze out like other species, it kind of sprays. And so I've kind of wondered if that's where the myth came from, that they could spit their venom as people saw streams of something flying through the air and just assumed it was venom when in fact it was coming from the tail and it was just their way of kind of spraying like a skunk to get predators and people to leave them alone. Dude, this is 